Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the topless astronomy podcast. <laughs> Why? Where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the sponsors aren't real. What? Sorry. Since when? when? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan that. We are Strange, Charm, and Up, the Astro Quirks, also known as Josh Caldwell. Addie Dove. And Hannah Sargent. Coming to you from the walkabout studio at the University of Central Florida, Top Cork can't be bothered today. You just can't even. Can't be, can't even. Remember to, 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 remember to subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our YouTube videos now feature chapter breaks, so you can cheat and go straight to the trivia answers. And we're making YouTube shorts. <gasps> Hashtag shorts. Hashtag jeans. It's a thing. Okay. Are we uh, going to be... We're not making YouTube jeans. No? No. Uh, you can now learn about Upquark. Jorts. At www.walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Oh, have I been promoted to the website? It's like, that's you're, me. <laughs> you are on the website. Wow. And you know what else you can do on the website? Buy a t-shirt. You can buy a t-shirt and support STEM education at the same time. I love that. Contact us anytime at WTG at UCF.edu and definitely do contact us that way if you order a shirt. Otherwise. Otherwise... It, it might get lost in UCF bureaucracy. There may be some, de there may be some delays in delivery. Um, <laughs> there's supply chain issues. There's some some supply chain issues that are unre unrelated to any global health crises. Our stumper today is orbital. Mm, so previous like eye socket, not eye socket. Although <gasps> our trivia has an orbital eye oh, socket component to it. Believe it or not, and that was totally not planned. Wow. Yeah. Um, no, our stumper is a planetary orbital. Okay. We had a previous stumper where you got to choose your planet's rotation rate. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, we're not changing the length of the year. Okay. But you can change the shape of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It still has to be the physical. The shape of the year. I like the that. The shape of the mm -hmm. orbit. <laughs> but you said, okay. <laughs> oh, I Hannah. <laughs> So, uh, it still has to be an elliptical orbit. The sure. Earth's orbit is very close to circular. It is. And so, our seasons are brought about by the obliquity, which I'm sure will very likely be the subject of a future stumper. Oh. The rotational tilt. I like to give these kinds of questions to sometimes to my like astronomy students, too, to see like if they actually understand how it affects the seasons. Mm. Like that. Usually, yeah. they don't. But your questions are not... My so question to you has no no right or wrong answer. Your questions yeah. probably have right and wrong answers. Roughly, yeah. yeah. Um, so bearing in mind you have no right or wrong answer, that Mars Excellent. is a great, good example of a planet who – it also has a, an obliquity or tilt to the rotation axis similar, similar to the Earth's. Earth. Um, but it also has a fairly significant eccentricity. So it does. that exaggerates its seasons mm -hmm. because for the Earth – we're actually closest to the sun in January. I know. When many people are experiencing winter, but we're just a smidge closer to yeah. the sun at that time. But if the eccentricity was significantly larger, it then was. you could play around with some funny things. Like you could have the northern winter based on tilt be at the time when you were closer to the sun. Yeah. Or when you're further from the sun and Depending then have a really cold far. winter. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you could play around with it. So if you could... Just dial up whatever orbital eccentricity you wanted for the Earth without any of the actual deleterious effects that would befall the Earth's ecosystem, <laughs> magically maintaining sure. all life, you of know, course. proceeding yeah. happily as we know it. But just for your own personal enjoyment, what kind of orbit would you like the Earth to have? Hmm. I, I don't know what the orbit would be, but I know that the change... I'd, I'd like I'd like it to be eccentric so that we could go and be closer to other planets at random points. Oh, and then get nice. I want you like could to do Mars. Some, yeah, you could get some really so cool the, like astrodynamic routes to planets, and you could get interesting mission. Oh, I love that schedules. idea because it also lots of times all, we are frequently. I don't have any hair left to pull out, but <laughs> if I did, we pull it out when inevitably every year or two there's the story about like. Next week, Mars is bigger oh, yeah. than you, you'll ever see. Mars will be so giant It'll in the sky. It'll be as big as the moon in the and sky. It's because yeah. it's like 0.1% larger yeah. than it was two years ago, the last time it was at its closest point to the Earth or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, but I if like you that. change the Earth's orbit, you could actually... You could do all sorts of cool things. ...have that happen, although the timing has to work out. Yeah. yeah. You have some sort of maybe resonance situation yeah. where it sets up where every there, five orbits it lines up with Mars yeah, or something. Yeah, do some cool yeah. observations. and 
Yeah, okay. Right. So would you, which if you had to pick one planet to have close encounters with? Um, I know it wouldn't be Jupiter because radiation and the madness oh, of Jupiter. I'm well, just that's really close that's though. I mean, you could stay. <laughs> you could stay. You, you could, could okay. Close. Okay. You could get, um, okay. I would say Mars then, because if we're looking at going to Mars in terms of exploration and humans expanding, then it would be nice to have a close approach and okay. trial that's technologies. A very, that's a very selfless answer because you're not thinking about it really. I mean, maybe you're going to be involved in Mars missions, but I was sort of thinking, what would I like to see when I go outside at night or how ah, I want my weather okay. to be? But you're like, for the betterment of humanity, the exploration of the solar system, <laughs> well, I want us to have easier ways to get spacecraft yeah. to Mars. Although my first response was, um, I, I wouldn't mind an, ex an eccentric. 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 You got it right the first time. Oh, I forget. Oh, it's so great. It was so great. I was waiting for us to have a, a reference to the wrong way to say yeah. eccentricity. And mm. it, it so that one. So, so when it's really, really long, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I like it when the sun's smaller because honestly, driving to and from UCF, uh, oh. the blinding sun. Yeah, you always. I just want it a bit smaller. We just need to make <laughs> roads not east west. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Also, so it'd be cool if it was a bit smaller too, because um, they would get interesting like eclipse effects. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's true. So that only, more. so we're only changing the eccentricity. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think it'd be fun to make it. Well, I don't know. We live in Florida where there's not really seasons. Um, but it, it would be fun to do something where you played around and had like some years you had like longer winters or something and you right. could like, I don't know. So you could do a I, longer It's sort of winter. Hannah's thing from the longer from weekends. From the seasonal standpoint. The longer weekends, yeah. <laughs> if I could have like a longer winter. You want a longer winter. So you want, you want during January, since you're living in the Northern Hemisphere, yes. you want us to be at Aphelion. Yes. And you want Aphelion to really be like 20 further or 30% out. further away yeah. from the sun. Yeah. Because then Florida might actually get cool or you just have like longer ski seasons, longer because snow to, seasons. To make it longer, we have to be further from the sun so we're moving yeah. slower. I and know. that also makes it a colder I winter. I know. Yeah. So it's not just longer, it's longer and colder. You said it wouldn't necessarily affect the ecosystem though, so it can't be that much colder. We're magically okay. saying that like The animals okay. have adapted. The animals I mean, have adapted. Yeah, sure. So I still stand by that because I think mostly just because it's 88 degrees outside and I miss winter today. Now, we could have a longer winter I without hate making it, it... that it's hot already. It, it, it would be... You could have it be a longer... We could change the obliquity. Obliqui no, that's obliquities, a separate one. But that's a separate question. Yeah, so. but you could change which direction the axis is pointing. Yeah. So that was the other thing I was going to ask. It would also be fun to just change the like change the um inclination but that's a different question yeah all right um i like i like the close approach to other planets yeah it'd be idea cool. and um How but much... i don't really want a longer or a colder winter i have to say that's fine myself could you change it so that you would have an orbit that would be sort of close to venus sometimes and close to mars sometimes sure That'd be fun. Yeah, we're we're mm. not really very strongly constrained by physics at this part of the show. Perfect. Yet. Perfect. <laughs> what is physics? <laughs> we're now moving slowly into the physicsy part. Today we'll talk about Gently. planets <laughs> forming when stars burn out. Saturn Aurora. Yay. We love Aurora. Planetary auroras. intelligence, which is just just for Hannah. <sighs> but first, this the episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by Feynman Diagrams. Ooh. The next time you... <laughs> I beg your pardon. I like Feynman diagrams. <laughs> the next time you find yourself lost in the thicket of fundamental particle interactions, grab a Feynman diagram to chart your way forward and backward in time. With straight arrows, squiggly lines, and spiral lines, oh. Feynman diagrams can help you navigate particle formation, annihilation, and the fundamental forces. With Roman and Greek letters, as well as multiple colors... Let Feynman diagrams guide your way through the quantum fields with gluons, kaons, bosons, pions, pretty much any kind of ons you want. Feynman diagrams travel with someone you trust. I don't think I've ever seen them with the curly cues before. The spirally things. Some about the spirally yeah. ones. That's yeah. fun. Travel with someone you trust. Yes. You're a little about to give you a hint <gasps> that Hannah is at a little bit of a disadvantage oh. for this one. So an American airline? It is an American something. I was going to say like AAA or something. That is it. Oh. Yeah. American Automobile Association. That's yeah. fine. We have AA. <laughs> Just the Automobile Just AA. Association. I forget what they stand for, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes you, that means yours is 
is better. It's sort yeah. of more, more fundamental. Original. Ours is derivative. Yours, you have <laughs> we the all the OGs. <laughs> Most the things OG. here. <laughs> you have the Automobile Association. We're the like the American one. Yeah. Um, there was an update on the Artemis One mission. What did we? Are there Feynman diagrams in the uh, Kit Caldwell board game? Oh yes, I think I feel like it's mostly Feynman diagrams. There are so many Feynman diagrams. Yeah, okay. that's what I was thinking about the, when you said that. Yes, my nephew is a physics professor in California, and he created a board game called Collider. Collider, and you create oh, no. uh, <laughs> particles in this collider thing. You it's very complex energy, as particle creation. I mean, yeah. A pool of fundamental particles, and you draw from that pool, and you put them together. And does it work as like an education tool, or is it just it could for in theory? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could definitely learn some cool uh, particle physics from it. Yeah, we should. And play then there's some also an element it. of like grant funding. <laughs> Yeah, there, there was some well. additional like so you get yeah. money to support your experiments where yeah. you can up the energy in your collider beam. Yeah, yeah, that's too, that's kind of too close to home. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like when you're playing a game, you want to be not really thinking yeah about, about grants, time and diagrams, <laughs> and grants especially, right? Uh, anyway. So on uh, space news front, we had um, Starlink launches. A hundred like more or something yeah. satellites mm. went up to replace the 40 or so that crashed uh, because of the geomagnetic storm. We and they put them recently. into higher orbits this time because of that. They put they, they that? started them on slightly higher orbits okay. than they had been starting them on. Yeah. Um, yeah, things, a little bit of altitude makes a very big difference when you're talking about atmospheric drag. Yeah. And they're so small, they're just so easily affected as well. Yeah. They're not that small, but they they have a large wingspan, so they've got a big surface oh, area mass ratio. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, there was an Artemis 1 update. More yeah. delays. Well, to May, right? The... Uh, to no earlier than May, mm -hmm. as we say in the biz. But part of that is they've actually made some progress, right? They, they're doing some They have schedule updates, yeah. schedule updates. So it's like a more, it's like a slight delay, but it's a little bit more definitive, I would say. March 17th, they are rolling it out to rolled the pad. Out. So this is okay. NASA's new mm. giant a uh, human rated rocket. I might need to set up a meeting at KSC. Right. I think I'm, I think I'm at that meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so on March 17th, they're rolling it out to the pad. It'll be out there for about a month. And during that time, it will undergo yeah. uh, a wet dress rehearsal. So they're filling it. Definitely want to see that. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they'll bring it back into the VAB following that. Once it dries out. Right. <laughs> um, and Ooh, then light it. <laughs> there's launch opportunities in May, and then there are various windows. There's a launch window in the first half of June as well, and then it's again in July. It's going to be exciting. Okay. So, big rocket getting ready to take off. I did manage to schedule a meeting the day the Falcon Heavy launched. The first oh, Falcon Heavy well launched done. out at Kennedy. Well done. So, I need to do that again for this one. And focusing his proceeding on JWST. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Now you can see one image instead of 18. Oh, yes. I thought you could still only see 18, but they were all sharp. I I heard today they saw one as opposed to 18, but that was a that was probably okay. a tweet, so okay. I can't confirm. My my latest my latest update was that they have 18 sharp okay. images, uh, one in each they it, it, it essentially had focused each individual mirror. And then they reorient those mirrors to superimpose the 18 images on top mm -hmm. of each other. Um, so let's take a... Speaking of uh, JWST, it has absolutely nothing to do with our first topic. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for that. Saturn, Saturn um, Aurora. Saturn Auroras. Well, we do like Auroras. We talked about them a bit over the last few episodes, I think. Um, and I really like this story. Um, this is looking at um, a new mechanism for making auroras. Ooh. Yeah. So um, it's a previously unknown mechanism. What's the old mechanism? Uh, charged particles flying into the atmosphere. atmospheres. And Which is how we blowing. make auroras on most planets. Right. Yeah. And like... On Earth, it's mostly solar wind streaming in and Correct. hitting the Earth's magnetic fields and then spiraling and pew, 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 uh, into the nitrogen or oxygen carbon, and yeah. knock some electrons Pretty. up or off and yeah. crash back down, make some photons. And on Saturn, there's and Jupiter. Uh, and, and Jupiter. It's, on Saturn, one of the big interactions is with the moon Io because it's always spewing out particles. Right. Well, it's a source of the... That's the wrong planet. Io is at Jupiter. Jupiter. 
and it <laughs> and dumps Celidus a bunch is of a big stuff. source on Saturn. Yeah, so um, one of my colleagues on the uh, Uvis instrument that I worked on on Cassini actually identified a spot yeah. in the Saturn auroral oval that mapped yeah. to Enceladus, um, which basically indi- you know showed that material coming off of Enceladus is in a certain point in the magnetic field, and you trace those field lines to the atmosphere, yeah. and that is a certain location, and there was a glow from it that was seen occasionally. Yeah. It's a little bit more prominent with Io, but still, it's still ultimately these charged particles driven yeah. by the sun. So what's the, what's the news with Saturn? Well, I kind of I wanted to give you this brief kind of background on this, because um, the... Uh, when we when we were looking at um, Aurora on Earth and people like hypothesizing where they were coming from in the good old days, um, <laughs> they it was believed that it was um, wind related um, and actually Aurora borealis originates wind related. Yeah, so oh, okay. it, it uh, originates from the dawn of the northern wind, and so it's kind of cool that now. Um, uh, this aurora that we've seen on Saturn is the first ever aurora driven by the winds of the atmosphere mm. of the planet. So it's kind so of coming full circle. I mean, how is that actually happening? Um, so th- the there's some uh, research being done using the Keck Observatory out in Hawaii and um, looking at the atmosphere of Saturn. And they've basically been seeing that there's, um, they've observed these winds that are... Um, that are kind of, gen- I think, like funneling up um, and generating lots of energy. And they've observed it, that it aligns with these aurora that are being produced. Um, so they've been using some near-infrared um, to map the planet's weather currents. And one of the other interesting outputs of this um, is that it's always been difficult to monitor the rotation rate of Saturn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this kind of um, addresses that as well, because they're able to kind of um, monitor these currents um, more accurately, they're kind of able to pinpoint better, better the rotation rate, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, Something yeah, like I that. Mean, the, the rotation rate for Jupiter, we're just, you know, with the stumper, we're talking about obliquity or the mm-hmm. tilt of the axis. Um, and that's Jupiter is like 10% or something. That. So it's actually the magnetic field being yeah. offset that enabled us to Figure say sort of how fast Jupiter's interior is rotating because its magnetic field is, off. is like a magnet that's not point that's not aligned with its spin. And it produces radiation. And it produces so then can you get this really kind of like a pulsar precise, kind of thing. Yeah, kinda of like exactly. Yeah. Um, but Saturn's magnetic field it's is like almost up. perfectly aligned yeah. with its rotation. So there's no beating of it. There's no flashlight it's right. like if you took a lighthouse flashlight and pointed it straight up yeah. and, sp- and, and then started spun spinning it you wouldn't be able to tell it was spinning yeah right because the light is just still yeah pointing straight up and saturn has all these crazy winds and there's not like a surface to find so right. it's really hard to figure out what its actual rotation rate is right yeah so um and yeah, they've basically found that uh, the weather system on Saturn is driven by energy from the thermosphere and with winds in the ionosphere um, generating these auroras is what we're... So, I mean, the aurora is, is, a, is an emission of light from some constituents in the atmosphere, and that emission requires that you're giving an atom or a molecule some energy so that it moves up to some excited energy state. And yeah. When it comes back down to a lower energy state, it emits... A photon. So, in the classical or old, you know, classic aurora explanation, that energy is delivered to the atom or molecule by the impact of a charged particle. Mm-hmm. Right here, how is wind? Wind is the wind, so it's wind is the in stuff the ionosphere. Itself. But what? So is it collisions between? Uh, is it like molecule molecule collisions in the atmosphere that's causing? I would have to ask the authors uh, or read their paper further down. Um. (laughs) So it has to do with, um, they see these like pulsing aurora and it has to do with like the field lines, um, how the field lines are aligning in relationship to these winds. So like, I think that the the ionospheric winds are sort of causing interactions like with the magnetic field lines that cause the emission that we see. Okay. I know that Saturn's, some of Saturn's, we don't really know what a reference point is, but we have, we can see the atmosphere traveling at different speeds down yeah. the equatorial regions. With very high, uh, very fast winds. Under high energy. Miles per hour. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, before we move further out into the universe. Sure. Uh, and talk about other um, 
uh, exosolar planets. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to drop the trivia on you. Okay, About the eye sockets. And eye sockets are there. Um, okay. Yes. So, so, so you know, where, where I'm are gonna we going? Give you, I'm going to give you a list of uh, historical and mm, I think, are they all historical? They are all historical scientists. Okay. And a list of fun facts. <gasps> And you're going to match the oh, fun gosh. fact to the historical scientist. Okay. Okay. Lists. So, so many lists. I can't keep up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on. Uh, so here are your fun facts. Okay. I'll start with the orbital socket one. Great. Stuck a needle in between <gasps> their eye Ow. and the orbital to deform the shape of the eye. For observations or something? To see <gasps> what... Things look like. If your eye was deformed? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. That's one fun fact. Fun fact. <laughs> that wasn't super fun, fun. Fun fact number two. The rest are more Do fun. Do we know what the result of that the, was? Some of them aren't that fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the result after you've guessed the answer. <laughs> These are fun or horrifying yeah. facts. Fun slash horrifying okay. facts. Okay, perfect. Uh, created a new alphabet. Oh. I won't give you any details because I don't want to reveal which alphabet was changed okay. but, you know in the in the language of that person's all right decided yeah. let's have a new alphabet uh was denied tenure at harvard oh, it happens to all we all yeah <laughs> uh brain was removed from corpse without permission Ooh. uh it's okay so that person's dead that person they're all dead i know i'm just was born during a lightning storm <gasps> and oh, that's from Sweet Home finally <laughs> Has a common physical unit named after them. Okay. And here is your list okay. of. So that's a we should know this one. <laughs> here's, here's your list of scientists. Yeah. Alexander Graham Bell. Marie Curie. It's not the last one. Isaac Newton. Albert oh, okay. Einstein. Carl Sagan. Mm-hmm. Nikola Tesla. And Benjamin Franklin. Okay. 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 Done. Cool. Got so it. We'll come back Just to that. Kidding. Uh but let's now we talk. need like a chart. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to remember those. Just can we talk. write? I keep seeing that whiteboard. And I just think I'd well, love to bring, write a list on that whiteboard. You know, bring a piece of paper and a pen next time. I mean, or I do have a computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. What's so next? Planets forming around dying stars. Yep. Um, Madness. Our standard astronomy 101 is. Mm-hmm. Planets stars form around and, new stars. Stars and planets form at the same time, basically. Yeah, so from the same cloud of stuff, contracts, flattens into a disk at the center is where you have most of the stuff. And yep. it's enough stuff that you form a star. And in the disk surrounding it, you we get do, some planets if you're lucky. We do a significant amount of research that relates to relates that. Relates to that, hmm. right. How that, how that stuff in that disk sticks together and, and makes bigger things. Yep. Um, it's a good excuse to go on parabolic flights. It is. Mm. There were some interesting um, stories, uh, interesting observations about stuff around white dwarfs, which is a, one example of a stellar remnant. So the star lives its life. Mm-hmm. We, we usually refer to the life of the star as its time on the main sequence, which is the yeah. time when it's uh, burning hydrogen through burning. It's converting hydrogen yeah. into helium through nuclear fusion. In the prime of its life. In the prime of its life. Yeah. Yeah. And then what, at the end of that, it goes through various fits and spasms. It starts stressing out. And yeah. uh, blows up big and uh, blows contracts. back down. And in some yeah. usually fairly violent way, loses a lot of material and leaves behind some sort of stellar remnant. Mm-hmm. So after it's in that, in that paroxysm phase, it moves off what's called the main sequence Mm-hmm. Into the As- the giant branch, giant branch, and then there's the asymptotic giant branch. Sequence. Yeah, there's different ways it can go. Kind right. Of. So it's the been a while since I've done an HR diet. <laughs> yeah, astronomy yeah. one oh. The sun um, will become a, a red giant. Yes. So it will get bigger, but its surface will be cooler. And that makes it red when it's no longer on this uh, main sequence. Yep. And so that's it's no longer in its prime of its life, as Hannah so eloquently put it. <laughs> And so um, 
and for our sun, we know that after that red giant phase, going to lose all that stuff, and what's left over behind is going to be what a white dwarf. Yeah. So, it, but sometimes this happens in systems where there's two stars with each other. Right. And that's can and like when the one star is dying, that can do things like create supernova. Right. If there's interactions no, between the, no, no, yeah, uh, nova. Yeah. I suppose it can create a supernova as yeah. well, but a um, nova can create different interactions between the two stars. We've in different binary systems. Right. So there can be exchange of material between the two. If mm-hmm. you've got one that's become a giant and the other is just hanging out there, now all of a sudden there's this ginormous star dumping mm-hmm. material on it. And one of the ways we understand the evolution of these stars is by laying these things called spectral energy distributions. Sets. SEDs. Yeah. I did Which that for my stands... underground, underground? Yeah, undergrad <laughs> research. I looked at SEDs. SEDs. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and they tell us how much light's emitted from the system at each different color. Yeah. And if you're just looking at a star, you see what's called black body spectrum. Yeah. And if there's extra stuff around the star, it's at a different temperature. And so it's it has a different bumps. sort of bumps and wiggles on that SED. Yeah. Yeah. And so this new research. For dust around stars. Okay. So that very much relates very to this. In protoplanetary disks, or in not protoplanetary, in planetary nebulae. So it's very nice. re- relevant. To right. This, yeah. Right. So, okay. nothing to do with planets in that case, but maybe it did. Somehow, <laughs> maybe something it did. a little bit to do. We, yeah. we we like to draw connections between dust and planets. Always. Yeah. Yeah. But this case, they um, are looking at a binary star system um, that's here, it's sort of in this post AGB phase. And um, when one of the stars dies, the other star sort of gets a disk of material around it um, that. Uh, and this, this other star is still alive. And so that disk is very similar, could be very similar to a protoplanetary disk. And so this could be another way that sort of once one star dies, there's a disk that forms around another planet. And then you can potentially make, or another star, you could potentially make new planets. Now, know? is that other star in the prime of its life? I think so. So. Because a lot of times... Um, one star will be smaller than the other, right. so it evolves Longer more slowly. Lived. Right. Uh, so I'm 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 imagining all sorts of great science fiction possibilities here. Yeah. Because uh, you would have around that initial star, maybe it had some planets that formed when it formed in the origin phase right. of the solar system. Right. And then you've got the second phase of planet formation. Late entry. Sort of like, you know, the parent got divorced and remarried and had a new. Yeah. Family. This is the <laughs> yeah. And what are the re- what are the how are the relations between the kids from the original? Imagine like life emerging and then intelligent life on an original planet. And right, and then all of a sudden there's a new new kid on new, the block. New kid on the block. A new set of planets. They could be a planet that maybe has some cool close approaches, like you were imagining, mm. um, close enough that they could easily go from one planet to another. Or then you've mm. got planets with a evolved life we should write a script yeah, yeah. it's writing well, itself well, but, like, and or one where you know your star is about to die but you have some sort of technology where you can move everybody off planet for like like you'd, you'd need probably a long time is the problem hundreds of billions of years hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands of years <laughs> one of those things billions older thousands. than the age of the solar system <laughs> of the uh, universe <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years probably to do what so like you have two stars next to each other right. civilization develops around one but then yeah. your star goes boom you got to move away for a while when it goes boom and then come back when these new planets have formed around mm. the other star oh so instead of then you going... definitely yeah you need millions at least yeah, millions yeah so you instead of like going just one way out of the solar system you just go out one way for a bit of a, a tour mm-hmm. and then come and then back, come back. Mm-hmm. okay maybe you go somewhere else to another planet for a while and then come back yeah i see because what I was thinking is, like, suppose we're here, and mm-hmm. suppose the sun had a companion star that blew up now, mm-hmm. and it I feel went like that through would be this bad news bears for us. Well, if it went through this phase and it produced a disk, it's just a phase around the sun <laughs> uh-huh. that then gave rise to sort of like Gen two, sure. you know, of I planets f- around the sun. <sighs> yeah. I feel like that would make life for us complicated. Yeah, and probably we wouldn't manage it. We can't I deal with more complex. Here where <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to but, magically assume that everything would be okay. Sure, <laughs> but for the, so for the actual cases they studied. Oh yes, the science, the real science. Yeah. So they looked at um, these SEDs of these of like eighty-five 
um, binary systems and they look for um, characteristics in the disks. So like we've talked about ALMA observations before of protoplanetary disks where you see um, like a gap in the disk and that, right. that tells us, oh, probably there's a planet forming there and you can do some modeling for how that would happen. And so they find um, that there are evidence, there's evidence of a mechanism that stimulates this gas and dust separation and it probably um, makes a disk similar to what we see in protoplanetary systems and it could be not giant planets carving holes in those disks right um, so and, giant planets and they say between 8 and 12 percent of the targets are surrounded by these disks that maybe have this transition phase which is a non-trivial fraction mm, yeah yeah so it opens up I mean it's a it's a very interesting new um, chunk of parameter space and they for do planet say, formation. Yeah, and they do say the question of whether such planets are first or second generation bodies also remains to be considered. Right. So like maybe cool. there was something already existing right. that then there's more or, stuff around it that they re and it the, reshapes the Right. Disc. So maybe the plants are there but the disk is the Added. plants are old, the disk is new. Yeah. So you've got old planets interacting with a new disk yeah. that's producing some of these things like yeah. you referred to from the Alma observations. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the asteroid belt in Star Wars is because of this kind of scenario. That's okay. why it's so crowded. It totally made sense now. Yeah. In now it all makes they preemptively knew this. They, yeah. Yeah. Yes, they are very foresightful, <laughs> if that's a word. Yeah. Um, one of the it's kind of fun. One of I the like future observations that's going to help them uh, uh, improve this study will be getting distances to these stars so that they can more accurately place them on. We've mentioned the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, mm -hmm. which is just a sort of scatter plot of stars by temperature and uh, brightness. Yeah. And to get the absolute brightness right, you have to know how far away they are. Yeah. You get the temperature from the shape of this SED that we were talking about. So that you can, can tell how hot something is, even if you don't know how far away it is. But to yeah. get its intrinsic brightness, you know its distance. And... What hmm. spacecraft are we using to get really good distances to stars these days, Hannah? Oh, don't. Say it. No, I don't know. I, Gaia. Gaia. Oh. I Which don't is know. a great a segue to our, to our next, next topic. Oh, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay. Well, on, why you, like, my eyes, yeah. I'm telling you, I have no idea where this is going. <laughs> well, I couldn't um, tell if that was, I have no idea where this is going, or I really don't like where this oh, is right. going. Oh, right. No, I have no idea. It could have been either way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had something clever to say, but I lost it. Yeah. Um, so, well, that's, a, yeah, it's an, an, an interesting new um, kind of fun avenue of planet disk interaction and gives some us some more ways to understand that whole process of planet formation. Oh, I think I was going to talk about how I really like HR teaching HR diagrams in intro astronomy, even though like some people argue it doesn't really teach you a lot, but I think you can learn a lot from them. I like, always remember it. Cool plots. Yeah. It's one of the few things I do remember from my astronomy classes. Yeah. We'll see if any of my students do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Gaia. Gaia. Gaia, in addition to being an astrometric satellite measuring uh, the positions of stars, are the Voyager is a sort of crew uses it a lot. Uh, hypothesis of a sort of coordinated activity of organisms on the planet, right? So that we think, you know, if you a, a simple-minded explanation would be if you think of. Your, the human body is a collection of cells, and each cell do often. is mm. you know, going about its business, but put them all together, and you create you know, a person which is doing all these things that are greater than the sum of the parts. Sure. So if you think of a planet as a collection of living organisms that are interconnected in some way mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, also through a biological system such as the hydrosphere and uh, you know, carbon cycles and things like that, you think of the whole planet as an organism in some sense, right? Okay. So. So there's this paper called mm -hmm. Intelligence as a Planetary Scale Process. Right. It's recently come out. Right. And so one of our favorite topics is speculating about aliens. Maybe is it, is it one topics. of our favorites? That's it is. A, Traditionally on the podcast, it is. Yeah. It is. Okay. You don't so like I'm, I'm, here, I'm, I'm here to, you know, provide interesting... The downer counterpoint. Not the downer, <laughs> just a counter. Just a counterpoint. Just a counter. Okay. Well, not do you, that. Are you not interested in the possibility of extraterrestrial life? I'm interested. I just... There's a... When we... If we hypothesize a lot about all these possible things, and I just feel like we're never going to get an answer, so I find it kind of... Well, do you... Th I mean, yeah. what about the possibility? I mean, so... There is or there isn't, and if there is, it may be detectable. 
right? Yeah. And so how do you feel about the efforts to try to detect extraterrestrial life and the ramifications for a detection or a non-detection? I find it. I find that interesting. Well, that's what we're talking about. I find that interesting. It's then it's the, uh, yeah, that's, just, that's just what we're talking about. So, right. So can we see it? What kind of life should we be looking for? Is it likely to be intelligent or maybe just simple? Okay, okay, I retract. I'm interested that I'm glad that people are doing it and I think it's worthwhile doing. Uh, I'm just not as invested in it personally. Sure. That's where okay. I stand. Sure. Okay. But you'll speculate about it on the podcast with us? I will speculate. Great. I mean I'm not I'm not invested in it personally. More than I am. <laughs> I don't I th think they're trading on the stock market. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean I think if if that discovery was made, I think it could potentially have profound implications for absolutely everything everything right yeah that's 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 something you should be invested in <laughs> when it happens i will be super invested <laughs> okay okay but it's not something that you spend i don't think a lot about that okay well that's after fair. after you've done 272 of these episodes maybe maybe i will be yeah <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more tell me more about um well so there's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a search not just for extraterrestrial life, but specifically for quote unquote intelligent life. So technologically advanced life mm -hmm. that would be essentially broadcasting radio signals or other indicators of a technological civilization that could be detected by radio telescopes, for example. So that's the classic. The Drake equation. Yes. Et cetera. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, so that's. You know, how many stars have planets? How the many of those planets of developed life? How many of those life developed into life. intelligent? How yeah. long did those intelligent civilizations last? Yeah. Did and, they bother building a radio? Yeah, <laughs> and like a big part of that does depend on a radio. Although I will say that like a lot of our search for life on planets in our solar system, and even with even with some of the exoplanets we see, right, are based on looking for biological signs. Right. That, or chemical signatures in the atmospheres that that would be induced by mostly by biological organisms. exactly so that's so there's like sort of the technological side of do we detect radio signals do we see like CFCs in the atmosphere yeah um, and then there's the more like chemical biological way of searching for things absolutely right so yeah. so those are those are not two different ways of looking for the same thing they're looking for really two different things yeah yeah and the failure of one doesn't necessarily say anything about the exactly. other exactly yeah um and so this paper which is called intelligence as a planetary scale process mm -hmm. uh, by adam frank david grinspoon and sarah walker and mm -hmm. david grinspoon's a friend do you know david i do yeah friend of ours from our colorado days uh is about the um, he has funny hats yeah. Key, 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 key point. <laughs> yeah. He likes to wear hats. I will remember. Um, he's been on the show, in fact. Hmm. I believe that. Yeah. Um, so, I think a very early episode. So he, uh, in this paper, they're talking about what you were just mentioning, Addie, like looking at the planet as a whole. How does mm -hmm. the planet evolve mm -hmm. as life evolves? Because life obviously affects the planet, and you were just mentioning some obvious ways, right? So that yeah. if there's life, it affects the atmosphere. For like oxygen in the atmosphere is signs of right. organisms. Yeah. Oxygen is highly reactive, so it tends to disappear quickly unless there's something pumping it out. Yeah. And life is the most obvious way to, to, to put oxygen in, an oxygen in an atmosphere. Um, We've talked about, uh, yeah, there's lots of talk of like industrial byproducts and things like that that can, like, so I said CFCs earlier, right? So yeah. Exactly. Chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah. That are, which we don't have hopefully in our atmosphere as much anymore. Not as um, much, but they're there. But they're there. And they're, and those are pretty uniquely life. created by industrial processes, right. not by natural living organisms. Right. So they, uh, to, you know, let's take a look at the evolution of the planet as a whole. And, how do those things interact with each other and how does the planet's evolution in that way sort of maybe steer what the subsequent evolution of life might be? So you could, you know, take our current situation here on Earth and human activity is modifying the planet in lots of obvious ways. And that's modifying lots of the biosphere, mm -hmm. which is modifying evolution of life in some ways, perhaps. Yeah. 
and that could Pumping then all that. turn back around and affect our evolution. Yep. Right? All the carbon dioxide and stuff where right. all the yeah. greenhouse gases were pumping into the planet. And, you know, uh, changes in what's going on in the oceans, which changes the acidity level of the oceans, which mm -hmm. changes life in the oceans. And then maybe some of that stuff has long-term consequences for how humanity behaves and therefore how humanity evolves or how the civilization evolves, which affects whether or not we're still sending signals out on radio waves or altering the atmosphere in the same way. So it's this trying to look at things in that kind of way. And it's, it's related, I think, to Freeman Dyson's uh, had posited that intelligent life or advanced technological life would sort of go through three phases. The first phase is you've got control of the planet. Mm -hmm. you, you master the planet in some way. The second is you master the star. So mastering yeah. the star would mean like, oh, that's a great source of energy. You would put a Dyson, Dyson sphere, sphere yep. around the star that captures a huge amount of the energy from that star. And that's interesting because that's something you could potentially observe mm -hmm. by looking at spectral energy distributions oh. of stars and seeing a very funny behavior because that sphere would be radiating at a different temperature and producing mm -hmm. a funky kind of spectrum. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, they have some a fun plot of like how the different atmospheric compositions would change and how the SEDs would change in that case. And, and we're sort of in the immature, the third stage of this like immature. Immature technosphere. technosphere which yeah. sounds like technobabble, but also. <laughs> But yeah, so we've graduated beyond the mature biosphere, which would I guess would have been where we were after the great oxygenation event of 2.4 billion years ago, <laughs> when the Earth's atmosphere became flooded with oxygen, basically. Um, and now the the spectral differences just goes to what you were talking about, Eddie, the CFCs yeah. in the atmosphere. Yeah. And so then the next stage is if we get to a place where we can sort of live in harmony with our planet and to sort of reduce those carbon levels. It's a big ask and... that. <laughs> a big but ask. it's pretty necessary. It's pretty necessary, right? It's necessary. If, if, gonna, if we're going to find, if we're going to still be around for somebody to find us, or if we're going to find somebody like this, then you've sort of found a better, ideally you've found a better way to live on your planet. Or I suppose you've started colonizing more nearby off planet yeah. stuff and then in which case maybe that signature wouldn't show up yeah so you're this really is sort of an idealization right? yeah. then in a way too <laughs> because it's like a sort of hopeful look forward in, for our planet as well as a speculation about what alien civilization life signatures might look right. like right right interesting i think it'd make a great film okay <laughs> just so just i find it's yeah i find it interesting it's just not there's there's just so much like for all of the different um, parameters that we're talking about. There are so many different ways that that would, if, if we if the point of this kind of speculation is to then make us consider what we're searching for, right? Then there are so many variations of like if if some of these things happened or one of them happened, and then the different results in in the the, the features that we would then look for. It's so complicated, right? Yeah. Um. So there's definitely like I I. I'd be interested to see what the different kind of isolated steps are within that. To There may be some, you're right, of course. I mean, it's an immensely complicated problem, planetary evolution, just in the sort of short time frames of our existence here. It's very complicated just to model what things are going to be like in 100 years. Yeah, of our years. own planet that we know that particularly we know well. <laughs> so much about, let alone a million or, you know, millions mm. of years. And there are all sorts of things like, how much plate tectonics are going on and all the other sorts of things we talk about in mm -hmm. planets that can affect all that stuff. So, yeah, um, that's just sort of, a, a, I think, uh, part of the point of the paper is just to sort of say, well, think about just opening up, open the, up the idea to yeah. think about things in this sort of uh, broader way. Speaking of uh, thinking about things in a different way, oh, okay. who stuck a who needle, stuck a needle oh. between their orbital and their eyeball. Are you going to tell who, us why? Who do we think we... is the most likely to here stick your, a needle in there? Right? The list again. Here yeah. Are we starting again. with that one? Okay. That's your first fun fact. Great. Fun slash horrifying fact. Mm -hmm. And your options are uh, Alexander Graham Bell, okay. Marie Curie, mm -hmm. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, Carl Sagan, Nikola Tesla, and Benjamin Franklin. I think Einstein or Tesla. 
think Tesla or Franklin. Should we go Tesla? Well, we can pick different. Ones. Oh yeah, that's yeah, true. Yes, yes. <laughs> we're going to work together today. Well, <laughs> team you effort. Can do that. Team Let's, effort today. You yeah. can totally do that if you wish. Um, Tesla. Tesla. Sure. It's Isaac Newton. Oh, Does, are there overlapping answers? Uh, yeah. There could be somebody could be in there for more than one answer. Sure. Because oh. normally you tell us if they're overlapping or not. I'm so sorry. I did not mean to mislead you. Because I thought the const- I thought Newton for the common, common physical unit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there's definitely. So a I wrote I wrote Newton off. Oh, oh well, yeah. I'm sorry. I did not mean to, dis- oh. to mislead you that way. But Isaac Newton was a piece of work, <laughs> and he was interested in optics. As you know, sense, and yeah. the behavior of light. And yeah, I was he stuck to a needle. Out. It was, a, it was mm. a little bit out there. Wow. And he stuck a bodkin, which I guess is a large sewing needle, oh, in between we... his eyeball and his orbital. Isn't that a knitting needle? I could be wrong. Okay, maybe. Oh, I don't God. know. It's a big I old, could be very wrong. It's a horrible needle that he stuck. I guess maybe that's safer than sticking a pointy needle because he didn't want to puncture his eye. But, but oh, he stuck he it in there like a, like in a, between a the eyeball. One, just to like deform it? But in, yeah. inside the yeah. eyelid space, in between the orbital and the eyeball, and then deformed it to see what he, what it looked like. It's commitment saw, to the cause. Commitment but... to the cause. So he saw you know, circular I have some more Newton news, like and it's sad news. Oh, no. The Newton apple tree blew down in a storm in Cambridge at home. Oh. Really? It, it was still standing? Recently? Uh, was yeah, just... in the storm last week. No way. It was still standing. Cambridge University apple tree. Cambridge University Botanic Gardens Newton's apple tree falls in storm. But was but it like what, one they planted how old from the is seeds that apple of tree? the apple tree of Newton? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just reading headlines here. Well, now oh. we're going to be skeptical. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the creator. Oh, fake let me, news. Hold on. Fake news. The creator said the tree was planted in 1954 and had stood at the Brookside entrance okay. for 68 okay. years. He said the tree was oh was cloned from the one that led to Isaac Newton to discover the laws of gravity. Okay. Really. That's cool. Well, I'm amazed that they had genetic material from that original tree. <laughs> um, uh, the apple. Uh, apparently, there are reports that he was looking outside and saw an apple fall from a tree. It <gasps> didn't hit him on his head. The original tree from which an apple fell, yes. leading to this theory of gravity, is at Walsthorpe Manor in Grantham, Lincolnshire. How are all of those things spelled? I'm just kidding. Don't spell <laughs> Just imagine lots of... Lots of extra letters. Lots, lots of extra of... necessary letters. Uh, yeah. Interesting. And it's alive? I mean, I pres- presume so. Hmm. All right. Well, in any event, we're, we're drifting a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Who created a new alphabet? Um, Don't make me read the list give, again. Please do. Please do the list again. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. Alexander I'll remember Graham Bell, this. Marie Curie, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, Carl Sagan, Tesla, and Benjamin Franklin. Bell. BF. It is BF. Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin. <laughs> he was ditching. He was in favor of ditching C, J, Q, W, X, and Y. What's we that? love those letters. What's wrong with those letters? Uh, he felt that they were superfluous. Okay. That's exactly why we love them. <laughs> and I, I can see like the C and the Y being superfluous, maybe, yeah. but not the J. Eh, J and G. What? what you maybe need. I guess. But he also was going to add new letters for the sounds ng, th, and sh, and others. Okay, so I guess if you get rid of. Sh- C, having a, like, CH sound would be, yeah. yeah useful. Okay, next. Uh, who was denied tenure at Harvard? Um, Sagan. Einstein. Sagan. Nice. Yeah, he was there as an assistant professor. Oh, man. Didn't get tenure. Hired at Cornell. Yeah. yeah. Did get tenure. Did get tenure. Did get tenure. Did yes, get tenure. exactly. <laughs> uh, whose Good brain call, was removed? Oh. Whose was, sorry? Postmortem. Oh, brain. brain. Postmortem brain removal. Einstein. That is correct. Sorry. It's okay. I was about to say, I was actually about to say Einstein. I'm going to give you credit for it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. We have two more left. Okay. Who was born during a lightning storm? Bell. I feel like BF is a... a, Too obvious. Too obvious. Yeah. Um, Marie Curie. Tesla. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Which is also obvious. Um, Also obvious. Yeah. And your last one, you have... Correctly guessed, but only incompletely. Who has a common physical unit named after them? Yes, there is the Newton. But there's also a Tesla. There is also a Tesla. 
There's also a Curie. There is also yeah. a Curie. But it was named after Pierre, technically. It's a little it's bit a little, ambiguous. Yeah. They were maybe thinking of Pierre, but the document that uh, announces it was not it's unequivocal. Sp- sp- might okay. do like subscript M. Just <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a, there there's is, an element named after Einstein. There is not an a element unit. named after Einstein. Who, is, who else? And there's not a Benjamin Franklin unit. Bell. There's... It is the decibel. The decibel. Really? I love that. The decibel is a tenth of a bell, and the bell is named after Alexander <gasps> Graham Bell. I actually That's like decibels fun facts. now. I, hate, I usually hate them. At least one fun fact. That was a fun fact. Fun Thank you for facts. the one fun fact. <laughs> that wasn't the fact we were trying to get right. <laughs> I only right. had to suffer through 50 minutes of, <laughs> of horrors wow. to get there. Okay. Well. While it may have felt like traveling backwards in time, that's a Feynman diagram oh. callback. Mm-hmm. It was just another episode of Walking <laughs> Needed the Needed the galaxy. clarification. <laughs> I felt it was needed in this yeah. case. Uh, welcome us to your hometown for a live recording of Walk About the Galaxy. All expenses paid. Yeah. By you. <laughs> Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our videos now feature chapter markers so you can skip to the good stuff, whatever the good stuff means to you. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. At walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag AskWTG. Our theme music was composed by Richard Drusick. Production assistance is provided by Logan Basinger. Thanks to our listeners in the UK. Up is back. Woo! Scrabble fans, stay tuned. Top will return. <laughs> stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. And I'm Hannah Sargent. We're the Astro Quark, signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Bye. Bell. 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 Bell.